Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to talk about uh, linear regression. Um, it's a uh, obviously a very important topic. So all of the things that we've talked to talked about up to this point uh, involve estimation of a parameter or estimation of uh, one of the moments, the mean, or maybe the standard deviation in a distribution. Uh, but but linear regression actually is going to allow us to uh, make statements about uh, relationships between variables, right? So uh, suppose you have a variable y that you think is a function of x, and uh, if you're making estimates in x, uh, and those may have some some uh, uncertainty in them themselves, uh, they may propagate through this function f to give you uncertainty in y, or also the variable y may also be some some fluctuating quantity. Uh, so there are many, many situations where we uh, would want to do something like this. Uh, and in fact, we, we often want to do this even when uh, we uh, have uh, very precise relationships between things but with unknown constants, right? So uh, the example uh, is when you have a theoretical relationship between two variables, for example, voltage equals I uh, current times resistance. Uh, if you didn't know the resistance, then you could measure the, the current and the voltage to try and get an idea of what that resistance is, right? So uh, this is your uh, voltage uh, current plot, and here is a uh, set of data that you've measured. And from the slope of that data, you can extract uh, the resistance, right? So your data looks like this in measurements of the current, in corresponding measurements of the, of the voltage, and you get a slope of that line. Uh, that passes through them. Now regression is going to be uh, the subject that allows us to quantitatively identify what the best line is uh, through through that set of data points. Um, so uh, in other situations, you know, you may not know that there's a relationship between voltage and current, uh, but you may just suspect it from your data, right? So you may not know Kirchhoff's law here. So, so in that case, you might guess that the relationship is linear, um, just by looking at the data and say that the voltage is going to be uh, some constant times uh, the current plus some intercept uh, that could in principle be, be non-zero, uh, but you might look at the data and suspect that it is zero. Uh, so what we can do now is to use linear regression in this case to find these constants A0 and A1, and uh, we can also go through and do some hypothesis testing to see whether it's plausible to uh, to make the hypothesis that this h, uh, that this uh, intercept uh, in this equation is is actually zero, right? So, um, so you may wonder at this point where regression got its name. Uh, Sir Francis Galton was studying the heights of people in different generations within families, and what he noticed was that you know at at generation zero, that is when you look at a, a generation of people and you correlate them to themselves. Uh, of course, their heights are, are perfectly correlated to their own heights. Um, so, so this is looking at, so these del H's are the same thing that we did in the very, very first lecture when we took um, a variable that was a random variable minus the average of that random variable, right? So that's the deviation in that random variable. So if you look at the deviation in individual members of a population from the average um, of that population's height, and you square that, you get some number, right? And now you take, uh, people uh, in one generation and you, so say, say fathers and their sons, and you take, uh, after their sons have grown to full height, uh, you take the, um, the deviation of the father from the average and multiply by the deviation of the son from the average. And what Galton noticed was that this kind of statistic uh, where you progressively get, you know, fathers and their grandsons uh, you know, have even less correlation with each other. And so, so these deviations from the average actually tend to regress towards the mean. Uh, regression towards mediocrity, actually, I believe was the title that he gave the paper. Uh, clearly an optimistic fellow. Um, but this is a, um, this is a, uh, basically um, the origin of the term regression. He was, he was using these techniques in studying uh, this phenomena of how these how these correlations decay. Uh, so you know we we use these uh, these ideas also all the time in statistical mechanics, but uh, I guess I don't teach that in this class. So so we will move um, uh, we will move on with our study of linear regression. Um, so uh, so we usually use least squares um, for uh, for our linear regression models. It's also possible to use a nonlinear least squares. 
Uh, but, but it's hard to res interpret the results that come out of those procedures. So it's usually better if we start from a model where the relationship between y and x is a linear relationship, right? So, um, so we're going to provide a little example here of how to go through and do that. Some of you may have heard of transition state theory. Uh, that is a theory that provides the rate constant uh, as a function of two thermodynamic parameters for the activation barrier. Uh, one is the uh, enthalpy of activation and one is the entropy of activation, right? So this is the transition state theory formula. It says that K, this is playing the role of Y in our, uh, of our uh, regression model. So K uh, is, our, is our response and it's a response to, um, to say temperature. You could look at it as a response to temperature. Uh, and the parameters that will enter this model are uh, the enthalpy and the entropy of activation. But now, if you look at this, it's not very natural for running linear regression on this, right? So, you know, they're tangled up in this exponential with 1 over t dependence and all these things. So what we do is to go through and we linearize this model, right? So we're going to, and we're not going to linearize it by making a first order Taylor approximation and truncating all higher order terms. We're going to actually go through and use the form of the equation to identify new variables uh, in which the relationships between um, between K and temperature uh, or some function of temperature are going to be linear. Okay, so here's how we do it. We take Planck's constant, we multiply it over on the left, we divide by Boltzmann's constant times temperature. Now we have a new variable uh, and then we take the log. So we, now we have a new variable log of the rate constant times H over KBT uh, is equal to delta S dagger uh, over uh, KB. And then we subtract away the delta H dagger over KBT. So now we have a variable that's directly related to Y, uh, that is our K. Um, so you can think of this now as being the Y variable, and, and this as being the beta naught, and this as being beta 1 times X, right? So the X in this case is now going to be 1 over T. Uh, perfectly fine to change, uh, change the variables that we're using in this case uh, to give us a nice, nice linear model. Okay, so, so what this equation suggests is that at least if transition state theory is correct, uh, that a plot of the log of uh, this kh over kbt uh, function versus 1 over t will give a, a line uh, with an intercept that is this delta s dagger over kb and a slope that is this delta h dagger over kb. Okay, so, um, so this is actually how people process their data uh, to get activation parameters uh, for transition state theory. And, and so, you know, another, another route, very similar case, you know, you might use an Arrhenius model for your data uh, where you have k is equal to some, some constant a times e, uh, the exponential of a uh, uh, e exponential of minus activation energy over RT term. So now if I just take the log directly, I get log of k, log of a minus this ea over RT. And so you can see that this is, this is roughly similar, right? You're going to get a, a, a line with uh, the log of k playing the role of y. Uh, the log of a is playing the role of your beta 0. And the, um, the slope is your, uh, your beta 1 term. And then we can make this uh, 1000 k over t. Uh, be the variable x1, if you will. All right. So, um, so this is basically the idea. This shows a little example of an Arrhenius plot uh, for the chirping, the frequency of chirping of, of tree crickets. Um, it's not not really clear that that this wouldn't also just fit a polynomial uh, function of the temperature equally well. It's a pretty narrow temperature range. Uh, but anyway, it's um, it's sort of interesting and thought provoking to think that maybe cold blooded animals might have uh, these. Uh, transition state theory like rate processes happening that influences their even their behavior um, okay so uh, enough of that um, we will uh, we will go on now and show um, so I guess the the point that I should be making here is that these fall on a nice straight line and uh, this author has taken um, uh, this author has I believe is Laidler uh, has taken the um, the slope of this line and found that it gives him a 12.2 kilocalories per mole uh, activation barrier for, for this process, right? So you can extract things that are physically meaningful parameters when you know the underlying theory uh, by going through and doing this linearization procedure. Okay, so uh, with that out of the way, um, let, us, uh, let us go on and talk about um, linear regression by least squares. Okay, so here's basically what we're doing. We're saying that some variable y uh, is equal to some beta naught plus beta 1 times our, our uh, independent variable x. 
Uh, and this is the deterministic part of our model. This is what we expect for the value of y if we know the value of x, right? And, and that is to say that we expect this epsilon part of the model, the random scatter, uh, to average to 0. Right? So, so this is now the random part of the model, this is the deterministic part of the model, and this is our, our response variable. Right? So, uh, so we have beta naught is the inter intercept and beta 1 is the slope in this model. And uh, if we go through and we actually look at what this expected value of y given x is, we have two pieces of our model y. The deterministic part uh, comes out of this expectation value, and you get the beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus the expectation value of this this uh, random scatter term, um, uh, the residual, if you will, uh, as a function of uh, x, a uh, given x. Okay, so, so we want to uh, say that, that we, we should find a method that will allow us to uh, expect that that residual scatter is going to come out to be 0. Okay, in order to do this, we have to make a couple of assumptions. Uh, we're, going to, um, we're going to take these epsilon values uh, and we're going to assume that at different uh, data points, the epsilon values are, are independent of each other, right? Uh, we're also going to assume that the expected value of this epsilon averages to zero, that is, it's, it's scattered uniformly, symmetrically above and below uh, the, uh, the line. And, and we're further going to assume that the distribution of epsilon as a function of x is independent, uh, is independent of this x, right? So, um, so this, uh, so what I mean is that we don't have the situation where uh, this is very, very broad in the, uh, in the residual in the sense that it's scattered far and wide at this x, and then over here it could be a very narrow, sharply peaked Gaussian. Uh, that, is, that is not going to work very well for us. Okay, So, uh, so we want to assume that for all values of x, uh, epsilon is Gaussian distributed with a uniform variance. Right, So that's this one and this one, uh, Gaussian distributed with uniform variance across all values of x, uh, centered on the line y, and uh, that each different residual is independent of the other ones, right? So when we take our random data, uh, so you know that, that's a lot of assumptions actually. Um, but you know we we uh, often don't don't check those very carefully, and of course we should. Um, but you know often it's very difficult to validate whether these are true because we don't really know that much about the dis the relationship between y or x, or we we wouldn't be using a simple regression model to try and get an idea of what that relationship is. So so really these are things that we hope to be true, and uh, certainly we can go through and and uh, ask more detailed questions about whether they are. Um, but that's sort of a topic for a later course. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'll just say that if one or more of these assumptions is violated, if we know that they're violated, it is probably preferable to use some more general method like maximum likelihood estimation to come up with a, with a better model for our data. Um, so, um, so how does least squares work? Well, I think that in the interest of time, YouTube limits me to 15 minute videos. So we are going to stop right here. And uh, in the next video, we will derive uh, this method of least squares uh, for linear regression.